if somehow there is a um, internet conflict or something happens, at least we are able to record and have this back uh, your way. Plus, it's always a good review um, down the road as well in the next couple days. Um, see how things uh, transpire. So more or less, what we're doing right now is um, we're going to make sure that the volume while we have the recording on is comparable to what it was. Some says the music was louder. Uh, and I just want to make sure that our is the microphone's at the right level. So uh, hopefully this is the perfect volume. All right. Five by five. Sounds great. So um, quick uh, house cleaning events uh, coming up and just disclosure here. Um, just make sure everyone takes a moment to read that the, the disclaimer, trading's risky. And I'm sure everybody knows that. I think that's the big thing everyone wants uh, um, as far as uh, Big Daddy Watch and CFTC and the SEC and everyone else wants everyone to know that trading is risky. So with that said, uh, important disclosure right there. All right. So where are we in this economy and what are we looking for going forward? It's kind of interesting that we got this fast money and instant reward. You know, our trading room the other day, and even this morning at the trade station, uh, every morning, every Thursday, we do a um, uh, trade station Thursdays, I call it. It's a morning briefing. Every Thursday morning, I do a trade station briefing. And one thing that we found was that there's a lot of different volume levels, um, measurements that we've used in the past. Obviously, volume histogram is one. On balance volume, as I've uh, probably... Uh, alluded to and have been teaching for a number of years um, and I can't believe it's a well over a decade at the, the various trade shows that we've been introducing people to using the OBV indicator and now it seems to have re, uh, surfaced as it, it, a lot of people following up with it because it seemed to have worked very well. Um, in in the last six months though folks, I don't know if you've noticed this, we, we discovered this within gold that the volume in gold did not match uh, the price action. In other words, typically you see an accumulation of volume with price rises and gold it didn't seem to have that. What we saw was an increase not even in, in GLD or did we see it in the gold miners ETF GDX. But where we did see it was in Nugget NUGT which is the leveraged ETF on the gold miners. So keep that in mind, leveraged ETF, that leverage, that word leveraged and it's not just futures or forex but it seems leverage is something of interest and we are also I want everyone to focus this because in the in the equity world um, I don't know if you're like us we trade a lot of options but we've noted over the last few months especially since February the uh, bottom the bid and the asks on a lot of different options even the spiders which used to be a penny wide have even at the money uh, uh, expirations are starting you're starting to see one and uh, two three cent wide spreads in the options if you've noticed that the spreads in the bid and ask of getting getting they've gotten a little wider um, and of course what makes bid and asks um, volatility demand is the key word there I'm looking for but I think what we really are seeing is people taking uh, in institutions hedge funds and uh, leveraged ETF so going forward into the third quarter uh, we're going to want to focus, and, and this is a, a maybe something I think food for thought, and that's why I like recording these events because we can look back at them and say, gee, you know, we were kind of identifying this before the masses were. But leveraged ETFs are are just now because the way the market's been trading, and I don't know if you know like me, I mean, and I'll show you what I mean by this tonight um, and what I'm expecting for the third quarter. That's what this event's kind of about, the, you know, the, the, what we're seeing for the quarter ahead of us. Uh, but we're seeing incredible volatility where the market ends up going nowhere. And so leveraged ETFs for that three-day three, three day to one-week type of move, you're seeing massive um, reflection of interest in, in as we gyrate sideways. So a couple things. It may be we're not seeing people trade as many options, but we are seeing leveraged ETFs uh, being played out um, by by more volume uh, uh, studies and, and that's what my stuff is 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 picking up right now um, I don't want to pick on any one particular platform but I'm going to share with you um, and I'm just going to bring up my trade station uh, indicators just because it's fast and I have a lot of stuff there just to prove a point 
Um, this is the advanced decline page. Um, I know this looks pretty colorful and it's pretty wild, but what I want to share with you guys, and I'm sure you've seen this before on my work, this is the daily S&Ps, this is the Qs, this is the Diamonds, this is the NAS, uh, New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, this is the NASDAQ uh, Composite Index, and again the Russell. So I got six of the top stock indices that we track and follow, um, and more importantly, what the main uh, stock segments of the markets uh, run by. So for example, we have the small cap uh, ET, uh, ETF, the small cap Russell 2000, uh, which a lot of small cap biotechs weigh in on the uh, Russell. We have the Qs, which the Qs, biotech and technology weigh in on. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, which high dividend yielding um, equities, of course, the blue chips, the bluest of the blue. And quite frankly, all the Dow component stocks are contained in the S&P 500. So with that said, um, when we look at biotech, when we look at energy, certain segments, when they have a good day or a bad day, weigh in on these various different indexes. What we like to study is the breadth. And when I talk about breadth, I'm talking about the relative comparative analysis of looking at daily um, advancers versus daily decliners. We look at that with the S&Ps. Most of you probably, if you look at breadth analysis, focus in on the NYSE. The New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, when you look at the breadth analysis, and when I talk about a market that is uh, gyrating, this is um, this is that kind of gyration that I was just uh, kind of, you know, with that squiggly line that I was referencing. Well, this is what I mean by that. If you look at the way the price action on these legs or these price swings, the violence of them, it also reflects in the changes of the advanced decline line. If you look at the changes of the advanced decline line, I mean, these swings that we are seeing on just a very short period of time, this is over just basically six weeks. I mean, back in, in, in just to compare where the markets are going nowhere, but the type of volatility we're seeing, these swings from a changing basis didn't take place as dramatically even back when the market was crashing in the, into this uh, time frame down in here. We didn't see a percentage change or a, uh, a demonstrable change in the advanced decline, uh, you know, in, in this period. We didn't see it. And, and then quite frankly, we really haven't seen that type of changes in uh, um, this swing, shall I say, in a very long time. So what this tells me, and I'd share with you guys, is that if you, if you think this market's being manipulated, and I think to a degree, we are seeing, of course, institutions in electronic trading at its best, and it's demonstrating the speed and execution at which computerization has taken us, that institutions are able to jump in on a sector of a market, jump in on an index, and cause it to move, not in just price, but the amount of stocks that advance and decline within that movement is just tremendous. So where do we go from here? I think when we see a market that enters a period of increased volatility, and I'm not talking about the VIX or implied volatility, I'm talking about price swings and I'm talking about indicator movements, specifically the breadth analysis. With this type of move that we see in the market, I think it indicates that, man, this is in the that, you know, of course, we've had the, the Federal Reserve and global economy uh, and global central bankers and, you know, the negative interest rates. And, of course, the, you know, presidential debates have created this. Brexit, um, you know, caused a little bit of volatility uh, last week. This is the Brexit vote, and this is the, where we come right back. But before Brexit, we also demonstrated some pretty severe waves or you know, moves in a trading range, which I think has, has really caused a lot of people to get, um, I'm not sure about you, but we've been kind of using this analysis to help us navigate the markets. And, and it's, I think, a combination of indicators have really helped us uh, identify with in conjunction to seasonal analysis has really been helpful. Um, and that's what we see this market do. It just seems that it 
gyrates and it rotates. We're just rotating from one sector to another sector to another sector. And that's all that really we're doing round and round and round again. Um, let me just point out something here on uh, the stock. Uh, page. This is the radar screen. I just wanted to share with you. Here are uh, top sector ETFs. All right, and and if you just focus in on this quadrant right here, just focus here. I mean, I've got pretty much the diamonds, GDX, GLD, uh, the IAI, uh, IBB, which uh, many of you are familiar with. IBB. That's the biotech uh, sector ETF. Uh, I'm not going to go through the alphabet soup here with you guys, but ITB is housing, IWM is is the Russell 2000, and we've got real estate, transportation, we've got um, the insurers, the KIE, the regional banks. So I've got a lot of what we call subsector specific stocks. OIH, XOP uh, for the energy. We've got semiconductors, SMH, and then you've got your bonds, TLT, your spiders, and then your your X series, I call them, the, the um, main component subsectors of the S&P 500. Um, XHB is um, your peripheral housing, uh, materials, um, your energy, your uh, financials, your industrials, your technology, staples, utilities, healthcare, consumer discretionary. I mean, those are your big bad boys right there on the block. And where we're looking and, and what we are seeing in the marketplace is the amount of changes and in just looking at the strengths and the weaknesses of said uh, sectors. So when you look at the overall market and you go, it sucks, and then you look at the IYR. The IYR happens to be Real Estate Investment Trust uh, ETF. And the, the, the amazing thing is this thing is broken out, as you can see, to newer highs. Uh, this is, to me, when you go from a time period from this year in January, when remember that faithful bank uh, said, sell all your stocks, well, um, maybe they didn't mean real estate investment trust stocks, because here's a real estate investment trust, uh, the IYR, and it's done nothing but continue to break out, even despite Brexit, okay, Britain's uh, vote to leave the EU, which is ironic because, you know, while that vote, that referendum went through, Nobody in their right mind knew it was going to, they were going to leave the European Union this week. You know they can't do it for at least two years, and there's going to be some secret super-duper rule that says they can't leave, and there's going to be some changes, and something will happen, and, um, you know, that, that's probably the long of it. But in the meantime, we're, struck, we're stuck with the, what they call technical forces of the market, in other words, margin call, hedge fund redemptions, and money being shifted. Um, when I look at certain markets and I go into uh, a market analysis, all right, um, there's several things that I like to look at, and one, of course, of, of, of which is not just the uh, participation rate measured by the breadth, but it's also a combination of things. So uh, let me take you through a little uh, analysis here. And, of course, look in what we expect to see coming into this next quarter. And that's what's really important. First and foremost, when we look at the, uh, the NASDAQ 100, the Qs, the Qs is, have, have really gotten no respect. Unlike the IYR, we're not near old highs yet, okay, number one. Uh, yes, this is a PPS. If you are think or swim, I got good news. We're going to do uh, uh, next week on Monday, I believe it is, after the market closes. I don't have the details in front of me this second, but it's not important. Um, next Monday, on Monday, you'll probably get an email invitation. We're going to use several different charts and platforms, one including Thinkorswim. So if you're a TOS client, a Thinkorswim client, the person's pivot study, it's called the PPS, gives these buy and sell arrows. And that's what you see here, the buy and the sell arrows. All right, PPS. Um, when we look at the PPS on the Qs, by the way, we could see this pretty, it, not as great of a move that we've seen on the NYSE. And one of the reasons is the Qs don't have exposure to energy stocks and energy component stocks, right? So what they do have exposure to is technology, some, I repeat, some retail stocks. And some of the big ones, too, like Costco, which had an enormous move today, um, relative to the overall market. Uh, we have Tractor Supply. You have Starbucks, just to name a couple. 
So there, there are some retail stocks out there, but for the most part, heavy weighting on the queues is biotech and then technology. Um, one of the things that we notice here is if we take a look at the breadth analysis on the queues, and this is just the advanced decline uh, ratio, a cumulative ratio level on stocks that advance versus decline. And as you can see, today, on today's close, we broke out, we broke out of an old high, we broke out of this high, and we, price hasn't broken out. Theory with advanced decline is simply the market, usually leadership is uh, in, in, uh, by, in groups of number, right? Strengths in number is the group uh, philosophy. And we've seen a breakout in the accumulation one of the things that, unlike uh, other times, where I get into the John Madden school of, of drawing, so we don't want to put this pen in my hand for too long. Um, this little uptrend that we saw back here in late May, you know, from approximately late May to the first week of June. Note that this is the on-balance volume indicator. Had a huge surge in volume accompanied by a nice uptrend in the breadth. So we had good volume check. We had strength in numbers by the advanced decline, check. And then the market did sustain a big upside move. And then the market went down. We made a new low. But notice the breadth, the amount of stocks did not make a new low. And the volume did not make a new low. So this was kind of a false bottom low. And what I'm expecting in my tell and read into this going into the next quarter is that we should see a rally in July, the whole month, up until maybe the first week of August for the queues. And I think the leadership might change because for the first time um, or the second time this year, uh, the first time is um, right here in late May, ironically, um, the second time is now we've broken out to a new uh, high with breadth in the market and we had an uptick in volume. So the good news is, from a seasonal perspective, we got to look at the queues and say, is this a time of the year where the market rallies? And quite frankly, um, the answer is yes and no. One of the component sectors that moves higher in this time of, of year, just to let you know, is in biotech. So I'm going to go over and I'm going to look at IBB real quick. And ironically, we're going to take a look at the, uh, the daily chart of the biotech. And this is, ah, look at these waves in the market. I mean, obviously, we are in a little trading range here. And I don't know if you want to call this a, I personally have been calling this a quadruple bottom, because there it is. Those are the major lows. Um, and one of the things that we've noted is that this market might be just, you know, from a, a short-term perspective, uh, we are seeing an uptick in um, at least accumulation. This is a volume, a, a proprietary volume indicator, and it shows the same thing as OBV. We are starting to see an accumulation of volume with this rally. Um, if we get a breakout in the uh, biotech sector, and by the way, um, my work suggests this is a pivot resistance right here, 267.84. I'm actually looking for the market to rally up into testing not only where those moving averages crossed, but also that pivot resistance, which is 282.66. I'm looking for the biotech um, sector, IBB, in the month of July. And I, I would say by the first week of August, at least in that expiration. So for options traders, here's a timing tool that, that leaves us about four trading tradable a weeks um, for biotech to rally. Now the question begs, how is it going to get there? Um, and when I mean that, is, is it going to break back the 258 first, or are we going to gap higher and go after tomorrow's jobs report? My feeling is, regardless of the jobs number, maybe we get some increased um, volatility. I don't think tomorrow's job number is going to be enough to move the market one big way or another. I really don't. Um, so my thinking is, uh, on a different scale, I have a lot of stuff that, that gives me a timing element for next week probably Monday, maybe Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, next week, on any pullbacks, if the market in IBV does pull back, unless it just gaps and goes tomorrow, um, that would be a timing element that I'm looking for because we have good volume accumulation and we have strong seasonality in the biotech that's going to help launch. And if this sector goes right back up to where it started from, 
uh, you know, into the top end of this channel range here, this 283, it's going to weigh in on the Qs and it's going to take the Qs to possibly newer highs uh, on the year and test the, the highs of last year. So let me get you that Q chart one more time because if you are a trader, I think it's important to understand we're not just talking of the market getting to, to in the Qs 111. That would be a nice move. That just gets us back to the top end of this channel. But I'm thinking that we have a strong chance to get the Qs by the first week of August, maybe as high as 114, and sayonara. That's my uh, analysis. Many of you have seen my work before. I've been doing this for 30 some odd years now. Uh, I'm not a new kid on the block by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, I, I like to do some of these webinars because for several things. We introduce you to products that we have, number one. We give you quality research, number two. We introduce you to what cutting edge uh, technical analysis techniques are out there and, and what's working. And that's why probably more people now are starting, you're starting to see a lot of professionals and, and higher uh, degree educators, not, not education, but educators starting to promote and use pivots, both quarterly and monthly analysis, which is stuff that we, we started to work at a long time ago, folks. So I think people are finding the value in the pivots and finding and more and more people using them uh, and, and in addition, it's not, you know, man doesn't eat on bread alone. You need other things. And I think the combination of tools, and if you're trading equities and if you're trading stocks, uh, or if you're just a day trader, uh, for example, yesterday we had a phenomenal trade in the Russell. We identified that Russell was uh, gaining leadership relative to the rest of the segments of the market. The bottom line is this, if we have an idea that one sector can outperform the others, that means our trading capital will be better used and better suited for a rate of return. And I'm thinking that the NASDAQ 100, and it's not just the NASDAQ 100, the fact that I look at the board and I look at these breakouts with the volume in the NASDAQ 100 combined, keyword, with the breadth, looks great. But what about its brethren NASDAQ composite, which has a lot of I guess you want to call it uh, under $5 stocks or, you know, low cap stocks, right? Low capitalized stocks. Let's take a, a gander there because it has kind of a, a different um, form of, of breadth reading in the fact that it didn't, it hasn't broken out. The NASDAQ composite, as you can clearly see, its breadth analysis, it didn't break out to new highs yet. Only the Qs did. But what I see... What I see that's positive here, what I see that's positive is that the breadth is appreciating, but here's the key. Look at that volume trend on the on-balance volume. It's moving up in sync with the breadth, and that's a positive, and we can't take that away. So the key is, are we going to get a breakout over that high? From a seasonal perspective, this sector tends to move up because there's a lot of stocks that move in, in concert with IBB. Um, so one of the things that we, we pointed out to our, our members the other day, and I'm going to share it with you tonight, is we saw a, uh, a really freaky scenario in that there's a lot of individual stocks that are starting to show very similar price patterns that are non-related. IBB, for example, and Apple. Can you imagine that? Apple and, and I, uh, the biotechs. Well, they're both in the NASDAQ 100, so maybe it's just that institutions are trading. Um, for example, they're trading these uh, uh, indexing funds, and I'm just trying to explain and trying to make heads or tails out of the market what's making things tick. Let me go over, and I'm going to take a look at IBB with you real quick. Now, this sounds like it's really freaky, and I, I agree with you. This is the IBB, and this is Apple. Or... Or not. I think I've had, there we go. So what's ironic is where, where you look at the price swings here, the gyrations aren't as pronounced at IBB. Uh, on a daily chart, it doesn't look as pronounced. On a weekly chart going back since 2013, it's really eerie that Apple and the biotech sector have traded in sync in trend condition. So the theory and what I wanted to point out to you guys, um, number one, is that right now my work 
we are in what we call a PPS buy mode in Apple. Um, Apple's not on a lot of radar screens. I'm not hearing a lot of people comment on Apple. It's not on, I don't know, it's, it, it's not on chat boards. I'm, I think so many people are just bored and frustrated with Apple. Uh, they've just kind of abandoned it uh, to a degree. But I want to dissect Apple because it is, of course, it, it doesn't have the weighting on the, on the NASDAQ 100 as it once did. But I want to, I want to point something out to you. You see this, this I'm going to draw the high there, the high here, the high there. I mean, obviously, you can see we've got a blue for a pivot. A gold is a, 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 another pivot. And these white dashed lines is what we call a last conditional change. We also have what we're, we're kind of looking at as a slight inverted head and shoulders pattern. Now, this is kind of weird because when I look at inverted head and shoulders or head and shoulders pattern, I also like to see, do those patterns exist in the indicators? Because that's the real identification that we might have a true head and shoulders pattern. What was the volume on the left shoulder? There's what it is. What was the volume on the head? There it is. What's the volume that's in the formation of the right shoulder? And there it is. So we are starting to see an inverted head and shoulders bottom formation created on the indicators. My volume indicator here is suggesting that this market is in not a distribution mode, but it's starting to be in an accumulation mode. And that, my friends, is kind of key. And here's the key. I think if the biotech sector and if the NASDAQ starts to lift, then in sympathy, institutional traders that are maybe not have as much exposure to Apple they're going to have to probably jump in on what's in the NASDAQ. So I want you guys to focus in on a few stocks. And um, one of the things I would uh, implore you to write down from here, any further bullish action, we would want to see a breakout over 96 and a half, a daily close, a daily close over that 96.46 in Apple um, can help propel this market. And I'm targeting uh, by the first week of August, by the way, I'm targeting a move, it's probably not a big deal, but I'm targeting a move back up to the 102 and, and even as high as 105 for Apple. Um, this is my larger degree time frame move that I think if everything goes right and we break out of that high, we're going to see Apple, um, you know, upside action to 105. Now, for every good story, there's a bad story. And let's start with the bad story. All right, I've given you the good story. Here's the breakout. We've got a potential inverted head and shoulders. It shows up in the volume. Volume's leading price right now because the volume is breaking out. Price hasn't. So that's a good sign. If it's true that volume precedes price, then the volume is doing good. It's doing wonders right now. So for Apple, I go, well, gee whiz, if this thing's going to break out, um, is there a chance that we could get back to where we were back in April? Is there just a shot that we could get maybe up to 108, 105? And the answer there is yes, but it's going to need to see a lot more volume. And for that, let's take a look at our weekly chart. And I'll try to bring back the focus of the volume. I don't really need it at this point in time. I wanted to bring up the weekly price chart for you guys and then this is kind of critical because going into the third quarter one of the things that's uh, you know intriguing when I look for trades I like to say um, you know what's the price action we've, we've had a, a, a lot of failures at this market and as you can see this is a that level that 96 and change it represents the last three weeks highs so you can imagine if we can ever see a market that closes over those highs What's the next thing the market's going to want to try to do? Probably get right back up to the point of the last major breakdown. And that's this big red candle right there. This big red candle right there generated what we call a last conditional change high. And that's right around that 105. Markets try to test those levels. And I think in the next four to five weeks, breakouts over this 106, it's really going to take the market up to that 105. So this is, I mean, in the essence and the spirit of a market that they haven't reinvented a new wheel. It's a trader's market. Um, we should start to see some uh, maybe interest in the upside of the market here. At least on a weekly perspective, uh, Apple looks like it's ready for uh, weekly perspective. Uh, Apple looks like it's ready for 
uh, at least a, a test back up into that uh, first objective 102, maximum 105 level. When I look at the monthly charts, I mean, this is just a decrepit picture. It really is. It's a very strong trend to the downside. It, every time it rallies, it breaks, it breaks, it breaks. It, it almost looks like Chipotle Mexican Grill, you know? It just looks, it, it, it just, it looks pukey. Um, Chipotle Mexican Grill does a lot of things pukey. It makes their customers sick, and the price uh, can't hold rallies, so I'm sorry for the, the trading joke. But what I'm looking at is a um, actually position, and, and we're looking for this to see if, A, we just started the month right here, uh, the market still is in a bullish bias mode, holding desperately this, and this is the bad news I wanted to bring to you. We desperately need to hold 92. We can't close below 92. 92 is the magic number, a close below 92, and I don't know what to tell you about Apple where it could go to, but it, I, I think it's going to be a real ugly trade back down to maybe 76 into this quarter. So this, what you're staring at here are quarterly pivot resistance. My thought is, here's my quarterly pivot resistance. First off, it's 108, and the quarterly major support is 76. Short term, it looks like, seasonally speaking, we could come back up, maybe complete a, what we call a trading range, complete the trading range, get one more goose out of the market. Short term traders, I think you could look for that type of move as it goes with the sector of the market. So. Apple is one to focus in on uh, for a short-term play to the upside for the next five weeks. After that, uh, all bets are off. So going through um, what I'm looking at, directional, and, 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 and where we look for fast money and instant rewards, of course, you can't really, I guess we have leveraged ETFs on the queues we can look at, but a directional play, because of, of, of the cost and the time duration of an option, sometimes an at-the-money wide vertical spread, is a, a right strategy. Everyone has to kind of look at how they take a trade based on one's individual's account size. Um, your timing element, whether you're a non-directional trader or an option directional or option seller and you just like to take in premium, timing is everything in this market. And I think what we need to look for are tools that can help us to say, I mean, can't you really say to yourself, man, it would really help if I could time things a little bit better. If I could say in the next month, what are the, what's the potential range for this market? If it, if it breaks out here in the short term, uh, we have pivot resistance that suggests 108. We've got chart analysis that suggests old highs, 105 to 108 is a range. And I can develop a trading strategy around it. That's what's really cool. And I think going into this quarter, uh, since we have so many new uh, changes in the market, that's what I wanted to just kick off the quarter with you guys and say, here are the right tools that I'm using. It seems to be working well for us and has been for a number of decades, and it's continuously working well for us. So combining the right indicators in your market analysis is crucial. And I think the importance for index and sector analysis, as I've just mentioned, this is that type of environment. We are not in a blistering bull market. We're obviously not in a blistering bear market. If we were in a bear market, you wouldn't look at obscurity TFs and stocks making new 52 week and all time highs by the way it's really bizarre it doesn't feel like that but there's numerous stocks making new all time highs um, and how is it best to pick stocks these days I mean let's take a look just to prove a point we're not in a blistering um, I did this before the market closes so it's, it's probably right in the same ballpark but measuring from the beginning of the year um, or the year-to-date performances, I mean, S&P is up 3%. I remember in January, and everyone was ready to fall off the roof. In May, another bank came out and said, sell all your stocks. I mean, this is, this is pretty wild, the type of uh, 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 market advice that comes out. Uh, I mean, it, it's almost as if this market purposefully likes to make idiots out of the majority of analysts, including at times myself, because... The market has a lot of what we call that delayed time bomb effect. You think it's going to go up, you know the price is going to go up, but it doesn't do it to the exact minute I want to see it. And then overnight, bang, there's the trade. You know, it happens at 2, 3 in the morning. You day traders, you know what I'm talking about. But when I look at the Dow, and we're supposed to be, ironically, in a high dividend yield to get that extra cushion of profit and getting the dividend, the diamonds are only up. 
they're up less than the S and P 500. Um, the Russell growth stocks less than one and a half percent. The New York Stock Exchange up three percent. And I guess this is where you could say it's been troublesome because the Qs and the Nasdaq composite they're down respectfully 2.6 and 2.8. Transport big worry. It was a worry last year because remember transports were down last year. They're down again. And bonds. I mean. Come here, baby. 19% for bonds. TLT year to date is up 19%. These are some. These are some pretty. That's a pretty darn big number. I mean, this is a six-month performance. Six months, guys. Six half the year. Bonds up 19%. So, can you imagine in, if this rate continues, they're going to be up 40%. Is that a sustainable move? Answer, eh, I don't think so. So in order to figure out where markets are going to go, let's ask ourselves where the hell have they been and where are they at now? That's the number one best question that I, I always teach people to, to, to ask. If you want to figure out where things are going to go, first thing you do is where the hell, find out where things have been, right? So take a look at this. Uh, this is not a tie-dyed t-shirt from the Grateful Dead show. Trust me. What this is is a starting point year-to-date performance. And some of you have been to my sessions before, and you know what this is. Just the entire, um, this, the main sectors that I follow. Uh, utilities. There's the XLU. From the beginning of the year, the utilities right now, just this sector alone is up 22%. This is as of today, by the way. So I just want you to know. This is not old stuff. This is as of today. So I don't. I didn't have you come in, waste your time, waste my time. I want to figure out, you know, in order for the market for this next quarter, what can I look for? If I'm looking at utilities up 22 percent, and this is the beginning and and the halfway mark of the year, um, I'm probably going to anticipate utilities sometime in the next quarter of a slight pullback. So I'm looking at maybe a 7% pullback to uh, value or norm, which is about right here at around 15. If we go from, uh, you know, somewhere in that range, if the utilities pull back uh, somewhere by August, that's a 7% pullback for utilities. The big question is strength in numbers. This is what I use this for. If the biotechs rally, if the bulk of this stuff stays right where it's at, and maybe the KRE, the regional banks, the financials, the XLF, XRT, the XCI, maybe if they lose less, right, move up in other words, if they lose less, that will have a, and, and perhaps you get maybe the semiconductors, the XLV, uh, the insurers over here, maybe you get some of these other sectors like materials, the XLB, the XLI, Maybe oil bounces back off that 45 handle, and we get uh, XOP and OIH back up, right? Um, that's going to lift the stock indices to new yearly highs in the next few weeks. And that, I think, is going to freak a lot of people out. So what I'm telling people is, if you want to really, you know, this could come down a little bit, and maybe this comes down a little bit, but if you really want to focus on the, the weightings of the market, you should have up on your screen right now IBB. You should have up at least the KRE. Um, maybe not necessarily so much XLF. I think the bank sector uh, is one to watch. Definitely the KIE. Have that sector up there. Because if you start to see some of these uh, other lower tiered uh, sectors of the market start to improve, right? Uh, and it, they'll be sneaky. It's just like uh, it, it, the, this year has been very tricky. It's been a very sneaky market. One day, I mean, everything kind of goes down, everything kind of goes up, but then all of a sudden, look what we had at the beginning of the year. The majority of sectors were negative, and all of a sudden, everyone's saying, oh, this market's going to hell in a handbasket, and all of a sudden, some sectors just lingered down below while others started to move up. So there's this thing called strength in numbers. The fewer the sectors are negative on the year, if they start to get positive and the majority of sectors get more positive or stay the same, that's bullish in the short term. So if we're looking for follow through this month and into this quarter, these are the sectors I think you should significantly follow up and, and be uh, watching 
for their performance as they weigh on the market. So here's just a, a little thing that I like to use for my friends at Genesis Trade Navigator. Um, they were actually the innovators of seasonality. They've been doing it well before anyone came out with seasonal studies, by the way. They were the literally the originators of seasonal analysis uh, for a charting platform. Just a little bit of history for you. Um, and so therefore they are the most reliable. I know there's a lot of product out there and I know you know they're probably all good and but this is the originator and this is the one that I've been using for well over a decade and a half. So with that said, looking at the uh, S&P 500, right, uh, which is ironic because um, it doesn't matter. This is even though the, it, it just the, the chart right now um, when I ran this, this is still this very similar uh, pattern to you know the last six years or five years of testing. Um, note that we have the, the life of history of the S&P 500 that traditionally that the last week in June, hello, the last week in June we see the market kind of goes down and then we see a little bit of launch and then it's literally which might come to fruition for us which it didn't last year. Last year remember August 24th the market melted down it was actually a week early so on or about the third week of August is when we see a traditional meltdown in the S&P 500. Last year, I think we had that August 24th meltdown. You remember that? So this suggests, seasonally speaking, while it's not without a market going straight up, there are some doohickeys to the downside, that we do see seasonal strength going into at least that, what I've been saying all along, or at least for the cues, the first week of August, we should see the market move up. My, my expectations are tempered. I said a new high, but I didn't say a tremendous new high. I don't think we're in a blistering bull market to see a, a rip-roaring new high, but we do have the potential for the market, based on the uh, breadth and volume analysis in the queues, to at least test the current yearly high, if not test last year's high. And that, I think, is... is um, a doable thing. It's also very doable and I'm not asking a lot for the market to give us a biotech rally in the IBB back up to 282, 285 handle. Um, that I don't think is an unreal, that's like actually a no-brainer in my books. Um, so with the seasonal effects and, and of course looking at these uh, traditional or non-traditional indicators, I think it's kind of uh, interesting to uh, to piece together what to expect in this next quarter, and that's what we're all here for tonight, right? Looking at the energy, and I think everyone wants to know about energy because energy, crude oil specifically, uh, you know, generally speaking, in the middle of July, after the 4th of July, oh, is it a surprise to see the market go down? Look when I did this chart. This is an old chart. I, I, I purposely uh, grabbed the old chart rather than bringing in the new chart to show you that the market is actually adhering to its past seasonal tendencies whether we know it or not or want to admit it. So before you start going and, and trading and getting all bearish on crude oil, do note that traditionally into this quarter, and that's what I got here, July, August, and September, and that's what I want you guys to focus in on, the quarter, and that's what we're here for. In this next quarter, crude oil is pretty choppy and sloppy. So we had a bad inventory report. Um, you know, traders decided to sell crude oil because they felt that Brexit is going to reduce demand. Listen, man, with the pound trading near the 130 handle, it's real cheap to go to, to Britain. Two weeks ago, we did our seminar at Seas. It was a great time. We were in the Mediterranean. I'm here to tell you, it was awesome. It was a fantastic time. We had a group, almost 20 traders. Uh, we flew into Barcelona. From Barcelona, we went to... Um, Mallorca, uh, we had some great teaching on the cruise. Uh, we went over, we couldn't go to Paris, Marseille because, well, the French were on strike. Um, the French strike a lot. Uh, that's not think derogatory, it's just a factual statement. The French strike a lot. That's their way of saying things. Um, so they were on a, a strike. We go to, uh, we went to uh, Rome, we were in Florence, and then we went to the Amalfi Coast in a, in a little city, a little town, Amalfi. And I'm, I'm, Man, if you've never been there, that's a that's a trip and a half, man, to just sit there on that highway. Now we've been to Portofino, we've been to um, Chicatera and other parts of Italy, 
but man, the Amalfi Coast, that was an eye-opener. That was pretty cool. I'm just, as a side note here, sorry to get distracted. But what I am going to tell you is, there are a lot of Americans. There are a lot of travelers. Uh, the flights were booked. The, the airlines were packed. Uh, flying out of Barcelona back to Miami International, packed, packed, and more packed, and it's crowded. So people are traveling, and it is summertime traveling. The one thing that we don't see, and we all know what supply is, we never see demand. And I'm thinking that in the middle of July, if the market, and I, I think we stay in a range, uh, 44, maybe we go to 42 and a half, maybe we dip in there in an overnight trade, something like that. But I think we're probably at the low end of the range here in crude oil. Uh, at the very least, I didn't see a complete deterioration in some of the energy stocks and as well as the energy component sectors, like, for example, OIH. So with the big move in crude oil, this is OIH, this is the daily chart, here it is, looks like a, a wild range. Here's the short-term range, here's the, um, you know, I guess, longer intermediate term range, right? Um, let's take a gander at the weekly chart together real quick, and I look at this and I go, is this possible that we could be looking at a inverted head and shoulders uh, bottom on OIH on a weekly basis? Because if it is, uh, what I always note in doing old school stuff, folks, is that the time it takes to form the left shoulder, and this is the head, and this would be the right shoulder, for a symmetrical inverted head and shoulders or any head and shoulders from the school I went to, and the school I went to was called George Lane University. George Lane, the creator and innovator of stochastics, he's a guy that I, I learned so much from. I worked with George Lane for two years back through 80 through 82. Many of you know that story. If you use stochastics, the guy who created it, I worked next to him, 18 inches apart from him. And, you know, I'd watch him do things, and, and one of the things, he looked at chart patterns, and he drew his trend lines. And one thing that even old school technicians will tell you, for a true symmetrical inverted head and shoulders, typically the length that takes to form the left shoulder is about the time it takes to form the right shoulder. So this could take several more weeks, and so we are in a higher degree range. Today, crude oil dropped to, um, you know, substantial lows. Let's take a look. Substantial lows meaning, um, at, see, that's Clorox. Not sure why I didn't get crude oil. I thought I did it right, but anyway, here we go. So here's uh, crude oil. Several weeks ago, we had a little pattern called the low closed doji. It's come to fruition, and the market's back in crude oil into this trading range. We're 44 and a half. You know, we'll probably find a little bit of support in here. So when I say that looking at crude oil, um, based on the seasonality, it normally goes down into the middle of July, which is, by the way, I don't know even, we just started, but the middle of July is next week. So the middle of July next week, maybe we, you know, uh, we don't see a lot of follow through. Maybe we, maybe on the outside, uh, I, maybe next week, the week after, we have an intraday low somewhere around, maybe it's 43, I, 42.80. I mean, you know, to get precise on a crude oil market is, is you know, while the pivots do work pretty amazing and call the exact high, um, you know, we want to look for uh, something a little bit more concrete. We want to see if the market does go down, does it go down on light volume. But from a seasonal perspective, what I really want to drill the point home to you, in this next quarter, crude oil doesn't make dramatic moves up or down. And one of the main reasons is because of just what I've mentioned. Summer traveling, kids go back to school. Um, there is an increase in driving. There's just more demand for, for fuel. And that's why, um, you know, the, the whole thing about crude oil is everyone can see the supply, nobody can see the demand. And it's not just demand here. It's India, it's China, it's all over. It's Europeans, um, and it's traveling. And people might not want to be trading the stock market because they don't trust it, but they will find time to travel. And that's a part of the European nature is to travel, and it's part of the American culture is to take a vacation. So with that said, in Canada, the same thing. People are hiking there. That's why you get these lulls in the market. You can't have it both ways. People are traveling. They're taking vacations, 
or they're trading, or they're not trading because they're traveling. Well, which is it, right? So in any event, I want you to be focused on the market, not to get persuaded by you know heavy media attacks that crude oil inventories and it's looking to be bad when, in fact, we actually see the market gyrate in um, this quarter. It doesn't have a strong trend one way or another. That's the, the point I'm drilling home, no, no pun intended. Um, but when I look at stocks and I look at the energy component sector, and, and I, I'm bringing up my uh, trade station radar screen, because on a weekly basis, like I take a look at Hess, and I go, gee, it formed a weekly high closed doji two weeks ago. Um, Hess seems to be in a very significant trading range. Yeah, it pulled back this week. But man, until it closes on a weekly basis above this, this sideways channel, this sideways range. I mean, you got to admit, you take a look at this stock and doesn't it kind of have a resemblance of an inverted head and shoulders bottom? It also does show up, believe it or not, in the volume indicators. So what does that mean long term? Well, for the next quarter, I would say there's a strong chance that by the middle of July, if the market does not crap out both stocks and crude oil, can you imagine next week if no one's focusing on it and we get a seasonal bounce from the lows and the energy sector rallies, what would that do to the overall markets as well? Maybe it won't affect the Qs, but it will certainly affect the S&P 500. So don't discount the fact that the seasonal tendency of crude oil is to go down the beginning of the month and then rally at the end of the month in, into July. And then it does the same thing all over again for August. So keep that in mind. All right. So for this next quarter, I think it's, 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 it's something that we all need to do in this environment. Did you guys hear the story about Citadel? I don't know if you know who Citadel is, but uh, Citadel is a large, what they want to be known as a market maker, and you would be right now seeing my fingers give the quotation in air, right, the old air quotation. They are a market maker. Basically, they're one of the largest high-frequency traders on the planet. They do billions, and I repeat, billions of transactions a day taking pennies, a penny here, a penny there from the spreads. So they're making billions of pennies every day. These guys just hired somebody. So they're a market maker, right? That's their, their nomenclature is, a market maker. So did they hire a market maker? They're, they're in Chicago, by the way. Did they hire a market maker from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange? Did they hire a prop trader from the Mercantile Exchange? How about the NYMEX? What about the New York Stock Exchange, maybe? No. They hired the COO, the chief operating officer, of Microsoft, the guy runs a computer corporation. So we got a computer corporation guy going to be working at Citadel. That's got to tell you something about how our markets are being traded right now by machines. So we have to think logically. And I think the logic is that strength in numbers, which is the breadth analysis, and we've got to look at the fact that for trading equities, using this seasonal analysis, I think this is a part of the code that institutions are using, truthfully, okay? But since everyone uses it, I think what happens and what we have been seeing in the last couple of years is a lot of the seasonality comes either a week early, and that's why running scans, and I've taught you guys how to use my PPS indicators on, on Thinkorswim, how you can populate these um, uh, um, trade signals like for example and again just because it's easy for me to bounce around is the only reason I'm using um, the, my trade station package but when I, when I when I share with you guys the scans it's like here's like a the high closed doji scans uh, that populated for this week a ton and I mean a ton of um, Preferred bank stocks populated this week. J.P. Morgan, uh, Citigroup. Uh, anyway, looking at a lot of the names this week that populated, we there's a bunch that stood out for us uh, that we provided to our our clients. A lot of these scans. If you look at here, what what do we see? You're seeing as far as a sector um, generated amount of buy signals, right? Um, somewhere in the uh, a, a few energy, not a lot, right? Not a lot. A few in the, oh my God, well, we had preferred and then common in financials and in healthcare and then different service sectors, whether it was Whole Foods, 
Whole Foods had a high closed doji, and Whole Foods, by the way, this week, last couple days or this week, we opened Monday. We've had a nice little trade to the upside, right? We had Whole Foods populate. That was one. Kohl's. Uh, Kohl's is a department store, and the department store retail sector has moved up. So this is that time of year where you get the back-to-school specials going, right? So back-to-school specials, uh, Ralph Lauren, we saw apparel stocks. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we've got Ralph Lauren moving. My favorite sports apparel company, which is uh, this guy right here, Under Armour. And by the way, you look at the Wimbledon champion, and you look at these guys. They're wearing. There's more and more people wearing the uh, the uh, this logo. There's more and more people wearing that logo than there is that logo, right? This is Under Armour, and that's a bad Nike, uh, just Nike uh, thing. I can't do the Nike. Thing. That looks like a sock, so I'm going to stop. Anyway, when we're thinking in the logic components, I want to get into an area that I start to see the market prove itself by showing a population of strength in numbers. So whether it's my scans or the breadth analysis, uh, it's real simple. If I'm in looking at some seasonal strength, now remember, next week should see a bottom in the crude oil and the energy sector. So what do you think we're going to be doing? We're going to be running for scans for buy signals. We're going to be running buy signals, PPS buy signals, for any stock or any group that's near pivot support. That's what near support. It's missing the word pivot. What's pivot support? Generally speaking, it's near our monthly support targets. That's a pretty logical thought process. When a market's entering a seasonally weak period of time, what do you think I want to do? Run for sell scans for stock uh, that are getting generated sell signals near resistance. That's pretty logical in its own thinking. So in a seasonally strong period of time, run scans for buy signals near support. In a seasonally weak period of time, run scans for sell signals near resistance. And this is what we teach our users. Now, these are some interesting scan results that occurred today. At the end of business today, I did you guys, I thought it would be a solid fave to sit there and say, hey, what did we see populate today? Ironically, buy signals, these are daily buy signals, so those are short-term in nature. Schwab E-Trade and um, Raymond James Financial. In technology, Amberilla, Triple D, Texas Instrument, and Sohu. Um, these symbols, now Amberilla, we saw a huge pop uh, in semiconductors over the last couple of days. So a lot of names like uh, Micron Technology, things of that nature, had a solid pop. So I'd hope to see maybe a day or two of a pullback. With tomorrow's unenjoyment report, I can't see where everyone's going to have that relief off their shoulders, but watch for some of these semis in the SMH because technology, we did get a concentration of buys in the SMH because technology, we did get a concentration of daily buy signals on my stuff. In transports, this was interesting. Knight Transportation is a trucking company. FedEx, I don't need to tell you who they are, and Alaskan Air. So I'd, I'd just like to take a quick second with you guys and say, um, what, what, is, what are these sectors kind of looking like, right? Um, and, and so when we look at a, um, Alaskan Air, uh, here's the little buy signal. That orange is the buy signal. It had an uptick in volume. Uh, holy moly, this thing's just gotten its, I mean, literally the whole airline sector has got its uh, rear ends kicked. I was going to say something else. Glad I caught myself. But, you know, when I look at the longer term monthly chart, Here's what my conclusion is. It's in a downtrend. It might have a counter trend trade. So short term traders, you know, I might find some value the trade going from 59. Maybe we get a pop back up into resistance there. Uh, that's quite possible. Um, I start getting excited when more than one stock, though, starts generating buy signals. So here's uh, United Airlines. I don't have a buy signal. Here's uh, American Airlines. I don't have a, well, we've been in a buy signal over the last couple of days. There's the PPS buy signal. It's been in a buy signal. Um, volume's iffy. Um, you know, you've got LUV, the Miracle Wing Airlines. You get on with the wheelchair and everyone gets off. They don't need the wheelchair anymore. Everyone's cured. That's uh, Southwest Airlines, Love. Now, Love is actually um, showing a little bit of uh, techn uh, technical analysis, Love. It does have a, a buy signal. And uh, I'm going to check this weekly chart out with you because I kind of like this, you know, 
what to me looks like a potential um, trading range environment for Southwest Airlines. It just doesn't have any positives. There's no positive volume in there. So on a weekly basis, I would wait to see if we can clear some resistance, and then I'd, I'd look for some upside. So here's the key. I, I could just imagine if we got an upside move coming because of maybe a week or two of reprieve in cheap energy prices that maybe the airline stocks get a bounce, especially if they're just in a trading range. And, in, and if they are, then it suggests, you know, maybe we could get a, a 5 to 8% move in the airline sector. If we get that, and if it coincides with a move in biotech, if it coincides with not all the energy stocks plunging, then that perhaps also weighs in the fact that people will see that there's um, a, a shot for the equity markets to rally. So that's where strength in numbers, I think, will, uh, if for our purposes, come from. Okay? So that is, I think, a neat thing. And, oops. It might make airlines, Jeff. Joe says we got news of airlines popping uh, possibly um, to uh, go to uh, Cuba, which is kind of cool. Um, Now, I wanted to get into one more thing here. Second. The screen is going to go blank for just a second. We're going to hit refresh for whatever reason. Um, and then we're going to cross our fingers because it will work right now. It didn't like me using the red John Madden pen. So anyway, here are the buy signals that populated. Now for sell signals, I found this to be really interesting. Today, we didn't just get stocks in the material sectors. This is Kenris Gold, BHP Billiton, and FCX, Freeport, MacMoran. All of those generated daily sell signals. Utilities generated, the XLU generated a daily sell signal, the XLE, the IYR, and of course the energy component, these generated daily sell signals. So I'm thinking a couple days to the downside, insurers, Allstate, Aetna, Chubb, Torchmark, Telecom, which has been on a tear. So Vodafone and Verizon, and then Energy, Baker Hughes, NE, and uh, NBR Neighbors, uh, those were the sell signals that populated today. So I look at this board and I go, well, these are the ones that really popped out. If the brokerage and the financials and technology rise, that will maybe offset some of the short-term negativity on uh, maybe a, 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 a correction or some profit-taking in Verizon. That makes sense because the telecoms have certainly been on a move. But here's another interesting scan results. Now, some of you guys might be familiar with the ETF called Social, S-O-C-L. It's a social media ETF. It broke out today, or it has been breaking out, S-O-C-L. Um, this is S-O-C-L. So when you look at at, at at SOCL, when I say it broke out today, this is a weekly chart. It really broke out today, right? So in in um, it, it's it's at a uh, pretty much. I don't want to really say it, but it, it is a cheap ETF, 21 bucks. But it, it broke out to an all-time high. It's a relatively new ETF at that. It hasn't been around 100 years, and that's what I am meaning by that. Um, and a lot of that has been, in all honesty because of the, the uh, Microsoft buyout with LinkedIn, and that's why I got MSFT-LinkedIn. But it's got Yelp and Twitter and Zillow and Facebook and Pandora and Google and Amazon and Baba and Baidu and Yahoo. And you know what? For the most part, our digital media age, Amazon and, and, and some of these names, all except for Twitter, is, is, is rallying. And even Yahoo, which so many people have been you know disgusted with for so many years. But a lot of these, this, this stuff is, we are seeing some positives. This ETF moved up. This is a triple ETF, RETL. By the way, if you take a look at RETL in just less than uh, a week, RETL moved up. And this is, this is what's really amazing here. And I am going to get the on-balance volume indicator in tune with you guys because this is very important. And I think brings home a, a main point. 
um, about the, the fate of our market. So the, instead of looking at the XLY or the XHB, the peripheral home builders, which has a lot of the components that are, are in this ETF, right? And like I said, this is a three-time bull ETF. Um, just kind of brings the point home that uh, A, institutions are trading uh, ETFs. And I think in this trading range, since this is what we've been working with, a trading range, right? We're seeing more short-term traders or maybe institutional traders trading some of these leveraged ETFs. And this was one I wanted to bring to your attention. Because in just literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and eight trading sessions from low to high, uh, I mean from 34 to like 41, I don't know about you, but that's a, that's a pretty big move for any instrument percentage terms, right? And, um, you know, I, I got a feeling based on some solid volume. Now, we might see a little bit of a pullback. It, it just kind of, and I would hope to see this thing pull back. But consumers aren't dead. And when I say pullback, I would say, you know, a pullback to the point of breakout. So as long as we, if we pull back and as long as we hold 38.88, that's why I'm glad this is being recorded. You guys can go back and review this. But that 38.88, the last conditional change, the LCC is, it, is as I called it or wrote about it a decade ago. The last conditional change is a very strong support zone. And over the next couple of days, it also marks the point of breakout of a very long-term uh, kind of resistance channel. So what, what I take out of this is I don't think the consumers are dead. It's been a delayed reaction. Uh, as long as this thing doesn't do a, uh, a flop and a plop, right? And if it maintains a weekly bullish uh, mode like that on, on structured uh, volume, there's, a, believe it or not, a breakout in, in, in play here on the RETL. And that, I think, is something that we need to respect. So when you think, oh, uh, and um, breakouts don't really happen, this is nugget. And I mean, it happened here. And I mean, so I'm just pointing out that nugget is another one that is the ETF. It is a three-time, again, three-time, this is the gold um, miners ETF. We've seen where institutional traders, because this is not something that regular retail traders are in for the most part, right? So what I'm suggesting is that when you see breakouts, um, you know, until we have definitive reversal signals, these things are, you know, the money's going in them because there is money on the sidelines for these guys that are, that are trading to add to these types of trades. So this is where we are seeing some action going on here. Amazon, Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, Costco, which had a big move, as I pointed out today, one that came up on our radar screens for this particular week, and then TJ Maxx. How did it come up on a radar screen? C-O-S-T. Costco came up on my radar screen on my weekly HCD scans. And I'll just pump, punch it up and like go by alphabet. And if we get to A-B-C, C-O-S-T, It was on, this is the weeklies, uh, Costco, excuse me, was on my monthly scans. See the monthly right there? The monthly generated a monthly high closed doji and it broke out of a massive sideways range. That tells you that we should see a move, a measured move, and, and there's a little bit more room, possibly as high as 173 coming uh, in Costco, by the way. Um, and when I say that that's on our radar screen, let me share with you something here that's kind of wild. Um, this file, as you can see, was written on July 4th at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. It has not been modified, changed, altered. This is my weekly thoughts and observations. Um, and this is what I send out to my clients. And, and we get this kind of information and what we're talking about. And by the way, there's that OIH potential inverted head and shoulders that we were talking about. Um, and, and what I did point out to my, my people is that we had um, component stocks like O'Reilly and Costco populated monthly high closed doji patterns, right? Um, so we are looking at these signals that I just don't do this after the fact for a webinar. This is what we put in writing and, 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 and provided to um, 
the analysis that we are using. By the way, here's our list of weekly, our weekly bullish uh, short-term trades. Marriott, um, Starwoods Hotel, Urban Outfitters, Whole Foods, Halliburton, which did pull back, not not dilapidated. Murphy Oil, Morgan Stanley, Fastenal, Kiss, Pulte Home, big move there. Lily. Um, Dick Sporting and OIH. So these are our bearish weekly bearish trades, Dow and DuPont, both of which are just they got hit with the. Let's take a look at Dow real quick. Uh, they're kind of related. Here's the big purple, the sell signal, and I mean, you know, relatively speaking, five percent for uh, Dow uh, this week alone. And here's DuPont, the weekly man. When you tell someone that's a bearish trade, that's a you know, 64 to 61, a, another 5% mover in a week. It's it's kind of, you know, it's it's hurtful. But it's nice to have the analysis um, to be on the right side of the market. So here's what I want to give you guys. If you like the way I think, if this logic makes sense to you and you wanted to be alerted to things of this, I've made this offer before. I'm going to make this offer again. So right now, if you don't want anything and you just came to, to hear what I have to say about the quarter, now's your time to leave. Have a great night. Thanks for coming. But if you want to take a real positive approach to your uh, trading and get some very powerful information, every week on weekends, I send this out to traders. Except for on holiday weekends, you still get it before the end of the holiday. But uh, my weekly thoughts and observations, it's $49 a month. If you want to give this a try and you don't know what the heck an HCD or an LCC or an, uh, an LCD and an LCC is, for you guys that are new, I'm going to give you my trading course, um, which is probably one of the most popular trading courses ever created. This was the one that helped popularize candles and pivots, and it's got the HCD, the rules and the regulations, as I call them, and this, this course will be yours for subscribing tonight. So all you have to do, if you're interested in taking advantage of this, uh, here's what you can expect to get. We give attractive risk-reward opportunities, actionable trades and option strategies, email alerts and updates. I have seasonal sector trends, seasonal commodity spreads, which is fantastic, Sec sector performances that we can look to exploit, like, for example, I just shared with you. Hey, guys, I think we can uh, look at, at, at strategies here designed to maybe uh, – Look for a the, 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 the biotechs to weigh up and, and, and play in on the cues. That's what I mean by that sector performance that we can exploit. Important support and resistance levels based on person's pivots. My last conditional change breakout points of interest. You know, in this um, this week's analysis, just to, just as an example, here's the potential swing trades. So an LCC breakout, if we get a close in the S&Ps on a daily basis above 2119, we're going to see a breakout. Minimum first objective is 2143. Uh, gold, we should see a pullback up to about the 1291.85 level. Gold is starting that knob spread. I'm watching this for a failed uh, rally, and it has not failed yet, or a close below 39.22. TBT, vertical put spreads. We actually did get in those, and we're breaking even right now. We bought those this week. Um, crude oil, um, we're looking for a LCC. If it broke and closed above 50.45, the targets have moved to 53.75. This did not happen. And XOP, if we got a LCC on a weekly close, it projects the move to, believe it or not, 48 bucks. Seasonal commodity spreads. Every one of these have the life of history of the spreads tells us the date to get in, the date to exit. All of these spreads are better than 80% win probability over the life of history of these spreads. So if it's 30 years, 30 years, 28, 27, 25 years, however long we've been tracking commodities, that's the, the, the nature that I put out for these spreads. We also put out, you know, just so it's all on one page, what the hell's coming out. But in addition, we give you the, the seasonal trends for the sectors. Um, this is one that's interesting. Of course, with Brexit being under fire, the British pound in July traditionally rallies. So the pound being under one, you know, it, it just broke down to a low of uh, 128. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You may. I thought it was 04. 128.04. Maybe it was 09. I might be dyslexic. But... We had an intranight low at 128.04, and we're bouncing off of that. So I'm thinking we've got support down in here between 128, 131. 
and, and you know, as we start to see maybe less and less fear uh, and or the fear subsides, we might see a little recovery in the pound. But it's ironic that the British pound has a strong tendency, a, a tendency to rally in July. Biotech, that's good to see since we we're talking about it. Um, IYR, XLI, ITB, these are the sectors that are seasonally strong. So that's why I kind of told you guys you may want to focus in on what is the weakest sectors right now if they recover. This could be the rising tide floats all boats for the indexes. So it, it gives us kind of like a, a road map and, of course, things to watch and different um, analysis. So that's what I mean by that. In recent notable uh, issues, in 6.6, six, six, we had, I mean, this was Columbia Sportswear, Nordstrom's, KISS, Las Vegas Sands, Exelon. Um, we had low-closed dojis, um, Delta Airlines, back on 6.6, six, six, that was a good call. Um, CMG, uh, we were extremely bearish on CMG. In fact, talked about CMG seeing 380s, and the low was 384. Um, bullish vertical call spread and spy on the dip worked out perfectly because if you know what happened that week we got a dip and we picked up the right spread um, all of these are uh, great little this was one that was beautiful a daily high closed doji in the British pound before 800 point rally ensued um, I will show you that because I think that that would be one I would say mm, I want to see that person that one I want to see and I'd be more than happy to show that because this is exactly what we picked up uh, in the British pound. So this was the uh, the move in the British pound based on the daily high closed doji right there that everyone got alerted to. And I mean literally that was the rally from low to high. We went from monthly support to monthly resistance and um, then again Brexit came out and that's it. But the, the beauty is this market rallied and gave the measured objective number one of what the profit targets were. It gave a beautiful trade ahead of Brexit before things got ugly. So no one took a, I mean, if anything, people took a, a, a nice little profit on that one and then hit the road. So anyway, here's the British pound now. Uh, that was the low the other night. What we would want to see is at least, notice that so far we don't have a buy signal in here. We'd want to see at least give me a daily close over 130.39. That's that gray level. A daily close over there, close over the moving average. Show me some love that will get the market eventually a, a measured move back into the 140 handles, probably between now and August 1st is my guess because of the seasonality of the British pound. So this is the kind of work that we put out um, and, and some of the analysis. And I gave you this week's stuff. We had 16 others that are pretty much uh, working. Um, the high closed doji in Costco and O'Reilly Automos. I think you guys are smart enough to apply what you want. Whether you're an option trader, it's up to me to help you maybe identify earlier entries and maybe some potential better trade setups. And that's what you can expect. Um, not only identifying key trend setups and statuses in stocks, commodities, treasury markets, We'll give you a thorough explanation of technical tools. And we do some really neat stuff like comparing, for example, on relative strength and correlated analysis, IBB and Apple, or the high yield growth, the HYG compared to SPY. That was one that was a very another interesting setup that we did and gave analysis on um, that really helped us earlier uh, this month and last month, by the way. We also do every Monday what's called weekly planning and scanning. We record it and send it out. I want to share this with you because this is the high yield growth. This is HYG. Back in February generated a weekly. This here is the uh, high yield growth. This is the HYG high yield growth weekly chart. It's been in a buy signal. Look at the volume here. High yield growth. If you recall last year, the high yield growth is what was to blame for taking our U.S. stock market down. If it was to blame for taking our stock market down, why isn't it to be given credit for taking our stock market up, right? And look at that insane trend of that volume. It shows strong accumulation. So that was one of our analysis that turned out to be phenomenal and that was a helpful tool, something that we picked out. Another one that helped us to identify in June of an impending market pullback was the fact that we had the McClellan oscillator showing a little bit of weekly divergence and to look for a pullback and on that pullback by the spider call spreads and that proved to be both right on the top and right on the bottom. 
So this is the kind of stuff that we definitely put out. This is uh, just to compare and to share with you stuff that you'll learn. When to use the daily McClellan oscillator and when to use the weekly McClellan oscillator. This is the daily. This is the weekly. These charts came from what? They came from the weekly market analysis. So this is the type of information that we put out. Along with every week, we talk about the daily and the weekly breadth and volume analysis on the S&Ps, the Qs, the Russell, the Diamonds, and the New York Stock Exchange. And you'll get access to the readings of these breadth indicators. And we put that out in, 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 in every week. Again, this is $49 a month. If you don't like it, keep the course. We used to charge $279 for this, right? So just by trying this out, I think you'll become not only a profitable trader, but a loyal follower. And it, this is one of the things that I think is a, 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 a fabulous place to start. If you aren't a subscriber, now's your time to take advantage of this. You can really take advantage of it by just going to the website um, and just go to personsplanet.com forward slash report. If you want more information, that's where you find it. I'll post it in the room for us. And you can click on that right away. Okay? There. Click on that right away. Here's a couple things um, that you can get if you sign up. This is just the $49. It's less than a buck and 50 a day. And I'm pretty sure you'll find value there your first month for sure. Um, also, in addition, if you want to order now, that's all you need to do. $49 for the month. And in addition, if you want to pay, there's a bonus. This didn't make, it wasn't maybe crystal clear. But just to be clear so that you know. If you look at this, right, I want you guys to um, examine this. If you pay for the whole year, it's 489 You'll also get a second course, and this is my advanced trading course, my advanced trading course. So you, you'll get two courses that you'll really enjoy. Um, and, and, I mean, in, if, if I went too fast for you about the advanced decline, the comparative ratio spreads, things of that nature, a lot of that's covered in this advanced course. If you just want to give it a spin, go ahead. This will be up for probably through next week. So if you wanted to go and, and just read through, watch this. This was one of our old uh, videos that we did. John and Cindy Faber at Think or Swim. You could look at that video there. Um, we'll probably keep this up and no longer than the next week, uh, and especially for that offer that we have with the trading course, so that you can get that. Um, for $49, you're going to get this course. If you just want to subscribe one month, you're going to get this course. If you want to pay for the whole year for $489, you'll get this course and my advanced traders course. But I would just tell you to do this. Just sign up for the one month. If you like it, you can always go back and just send us an email saying, hey, I want the other deal. I like this. Just do it a test drive, buck fifty a day, $49 a month. Anyway, I hope you found value in tonight's uh, presentation. This is one that I take a lot of pride in. I do this work for myself, and this is what's kind of, I think we're starting to see a lot of people pay attention to what we've been doing over the years because, you know what, it's been working. It's been working. And it really has kept us on a light. You'll see some some uh, real-life testimonials, too. Uh, we have uh, fund managers. We have retired fund managers. I mean, I really do attract the people that have been around the ringer. You know, they 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 know the BS when they see it. They've they've been there, done that, and they come to me for the real thing. And this has been some. Um, I mean, this has been some active trading. There's no doubt about it. Um, and you know, it's it's kind of nice. Some have slipped through our fingers, no doubt about it. And some we've caught. And you know what? There's always going to be those. Uh, but for the most part. We've been on Q this year, and if you've ever seen me this year, you know for the most part we've been a lot more right than we've been wrong, and that's what stops are for, and that's what the find risk strategies are. I never put my people, myself or you, in harm's way by doing stupid, outrageous, uh, leveraged risk-reward ratio trades that are beyond uh, recovery, right? I, and I think that you know the the person that likes to get rich quick. You know, there's, well, it, it, it is true, you, you get home runs every once in a while, uh, like Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, you know, getting bought out, um, but every once in a while, I think it's nice on, 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 
on an even keel basis that we do what? Hit home runs once in a while, but for the most part, our trades are based on base hits, doubles, and every once in a while, some triples. So that's what this is designed for, to keep us on the right side and to give you an edge in the market. How you trade it's another story, right? Whether it's going with the stock, going with a long directional strategy, selling out of the money puts on a bullish move. Those are the things that I think uh, are going to help you. So if, if you guys um, don't mind, we're going to wrap it up. We went a little bit over tonight. I thank you all very much for your attendance, and I hope you got something at least uh, out of how we use the indicators, uh, number one. And number two, what to kind of look for going forward, uh, especially in what I think might be an exciting pop in the queues, especially if that one single indicator uh, is, if it, if it does work. If it does work, we should see by the first week of August a new high into the queues, uh, possibly as high as 114 is my targets for the queues. In the S&Ps, um, 2146, you get a close over that 2119, and 2146, 2143 is my actual number, but 2146, let's call it, you know, I want to downplay 2150. I think that is, that's the obvious uptick, right? So with the breakout in the, uh, the breadth analysis, uh, right here, I like the breakout and the breadth analysis and the volume in the queues. I like the breakout and the volume analysis in the NASDAQ composite. And these, you know, if it's true that the breadth and volume lead price, then we should see a market that moves up into the first week of August. So that's what I got for the, for the quarterly outlook. Guys, we'll see you next week. Have a great evening. Thanks, everyone.